Good evening and welcome to Join Us Prime. Coming up, this are names of 17 political parties struck out of the Electoral Commission's books, including Agwesi Adayo the case UPP, following their dormant status. We'll hear from the EC. When we, we, we come to the realization that clearly, based on the law, some parties are not meeting the requirements to exist as political parties, we may end, the, we may end up uh, removing them from the list of political parties. Uh, also coming up, Oliver Barker Vorma was described as surprising an order of the judge presiding over his treason felony trial to remove the Ghana flag that was strapped around his neck in court as he implores judiciary not to tolerate what he called the delayed tactics of the state prosecution. And if it took six months to get through something that was done in a day, it shows a clear intention on the part of the state not to, well, very, very unconcerned about the delays to justice. I think that it's important to me that the flag is a symbol of what this republic stands for, isn't it? We have details from a park day in court where evangelist Patricia Sedu alias Agrada was denied bail again and also the trial of former PPA boss ABA AJ for the contract for sales scandal scheduled for November. Now, the fate of 17 political parties hangs in the balance as the Electoral Commission of Ghana is giving them one week to justify their inclusion. These political parties, according to the latest audit by the Commission, have no regional and national presence contrary to the requirement of the law and therefore risk having their registrations cancelled. The cohort have up to next Thursday, October 20, 2022, to show proof why their registration should not be cancelled under the Political Parties Act of 2000. Act 574. So let's give you a full list of possibly some of the political parties being struck out of the Electoral Commission's books. Isaac Kofi J is with our research desk and joins us through Zoom with more. Isaac, how explicit is the law on the regional representation when it comes to the establishment? Right, so page four of the Political Parties, uh, you know, Act 574-2000. Uh, has the conditions for registering a political party in Ghana, and it states that the commission shall not register a political party under you know this act unless uh, one the political party has branches in all regions and in addition organized uh, in not less than two thirds of the districts in each region. Also, uh, there is in each district at least uh, one uh, founding member of the party who is ordinarily a resident in the district or is a registered voter uh, in the district, Grace. So give us the names of the political parties uh, who are likely to lose their licenses by next week. So there are currently about uh, 27 political parties on the EC's uh, website mm -hmm. and 17 of them risks being you know, removed. And these parties include the Democratic People's Party, which is DPP, uh, the United Front Party, UFP, United Development Party, uh, UDCFP, and then, you know, other political parties. For the sake of background, you know that the United Progress, you know, party, the UPP, uh, was uh, formed and being led by the Kumasi base, um, uh, Akwesi Adai, who is popularly known as uh, ODK. Mm -hmm. And the United, you know, uh, Front Party, UFP, which was also formed by the same Akwesi Adai Odike and Nana Ejenim uh, Boatin, uh, but you know that Odike moved to form the UPP. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you look at the DFP, which is formed by Dr. Obed, you know, Yao Asamoah and um, some other members who go agree from the NDC, you know, formed this party in 2005. There's also the National Reforms Party, U URP. Uh, led by Gusitano and other, you know, uh, breakaway members from the NDC in 2002, Grace. Mm. Now, so when you strike out the difference uh, out of this 27, how many political parties will remain? So if you go on to the um, EC's portal or their website, there is a dashboard. Um, and on the dashboard, you can find information like the total number of political parties in Ghana, and then also the total number of uh, polling stations also in Ghana. So if these parties fail to meet the deadline that the EC is given, then we will end up with just about 10 parties surviving out of the current total of 27. And mm. so that's about 63% of the total number of political parties we have currently uh, being slashed if they are not able to meet the deadline by Thursday, next week Thursday. 
Well, um, Deputy Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Eric Bosman Asari, has been explaining reasons accounting for this audit by the Electoral Commission. Uh, so far, uh, the exercise has been concluded. Uh, when you conclude such a major exercise, you need to have a report uh, for the uh, commissioners to look at it and come up with certain conclusions. Indeed, we had a team that went around the whole country and at the, at the national office, some of us even took part. Uh, the chairperson, myself, the deputy chairman of operation, we even went to some of the offices of the political parties. And the commission is currently looking at the report from the field. And based on the outcome of that particular exercise, the commission will have to make a determination. Mm -hmm. we, when you look at the law, the law clearly states that political parties are suppo supposed to meet certain requirements. For example, when you look at the district level, they are supposed to operate in two tests right. of the districts. And right. we expect that they will have regional, national offices. Mm -hmm. So as an institution which is supposed to ensure that the political parties conform according to the rules of our country and according, according to the democratic ethos, we are compelled mm -hmm. to make sure that the right things are done. So I believe that the commission will look at the report critically and will make the findings mm -hmm. available mm -hmm. to Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And when we, we, we come to the realization that clearly based on the law, some parties are not meeting the requirements to exist as political parties, we may end, the, we may end up uh, removing them from the list of political parties. Uh Meanwhile, former President John Mahama says the opposition National Democratic Congress is coming along with its own referee into the 2024 general elections, citing fallout from the last presidential elections. John Mahama says he has come to the conclusion that the Electoral Commission is not sufficiently independent. He adds that in spite of countless efforts by the Peace Council to mediate differences between the Commission and the NDC, the commissioners have not availed themselves for dialogue. John Mahama says the only way out for the NDC is to go into the 2024 elections with its own referee. He explains why. Now, responding to the claims, Dr. Bosman Asari says the EC has no problems with the opposition NDC. At, at the EC level, we don't have any problem with any political party. We don't have any problem with the NDC. Right. You know, I think you heard the NDC boycotted IPAC right. after the 2020 yeah, elections. elections yeah. All the letters to the inviting the parties to IPAC, NDC is always... Uh, oh, you keep inviting them? Oh, we keep inviting them. The last one I checked uh, on, on the email list, okay. Mr. Johnson, I do <laughs> receive the email. You sent we send invite. letters, we invite. Right. So they have boycott. If they, they are saying they have boycott, mm. but they receive the letters. So you keep inviting we them? We keep inviting. You, you don't want to Hopefully, stop Hopefully, we don't know if this month or next month there will be another IPAC. We will still invite. Now, Minister for Lands and Natural Resources has called for police investigation into circumstances leading to recent attacks on Chief of Dompim in the Western region. Nana Nyuwa Pinyin, claimant to the stool of Dompim, Pepesa says his attack is linked to his recent outburst against political appointees complicit in illegal mining. The chief claimed that the Deputy Land and Natural Resources Minister, George Mirkuduka, operated one of the illegal mining firms. The traditional ruler says his cousin was attacked just yesterday, by some assailant linked to political appointees. Uh, a group of people who say they are uh, 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 sympathizers or the followers of Duca and Kesey. They say, I want to take from their mouth the very food that they are eating. Right. Uh, you're saying that these people identified themselves to you. Uh, exactly. It, 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 is, it is not a secret. Could you, a mob of people and ride down to my mommy's house and set the whole store ablaze. So the, the next day, as law abiding person, I decided to go and then report it officially to the uh, 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 my district police commander. I was there when I was called that I should come back. What is happening in Dompim? It is a nice one. I should come and witness it myself. I write down only to come and see my nephew. The person in question is law a bodyguard. He's a family member. The guy is butchered. If you have pictures of uh, pictures to that effect, or pictures of that particular person, it's butchered lying in a stream of blood. So I called, I, I instructed some people to take him to hospital. So he was right to the local hospital here, and later they said they cannot treat him there. So we took him to another private hospital in Takwa now. So as we speak, um, we thank God 
He's in coma. He cannot talk now, but he's alive. What have the police said to you? Uh, what action are they taking following your report of, of these acts of violence? Well, when it comes to Takwahi, ever since this situation started, none, none of the other side has been arrested. Meanwhile, Sector Minister Samuel Abujinapo is calling for police investigations into as to ascertain the claims by the traditional ruler. Samuel Abujinapo added that politicians are becoming vulnerable to constant accusations in the wake of the fight against illegal mining. I think that the matches to do with the dumping, Pepper Chief, Chief, and the gory pictures of all sin, they should be investigated. The, the police have to investigate it. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. In a democratic world when these things happen just as it is for all other crimes the police has to investigate him and, and and bring out the facts and the evidence and then we'll deal with that that's the way i see it because even from where i said i've heard conflicting reports some say it was as a result of chieftaincy dispute some also seem to make the suggestion you've made some even say that it was a motor accident you know so you have all kinds of uh, claims but when these things happen the right thing to do is to investigate. So let's hold on for the police to conclude with their investigations. Yeah. Yes, the deputy minister, oh, but that, that is a straightforward matter. The, the rule of this business is um, evidence. You know, because, uh, Awuni, uh, I hope you agree with me that here I am with this microphone speaking live on national TV. I could just make a very damning allegation against you that you are this and that and that. It cannot, in itself, without more, hold. And, and I think we should all be interested in that. Unfortunately, political people, those of us who venture into public life and venture into uh, policy positions, we are so vulnerable and we get punched all the time. Aula Sewa, coordinator for Echo Conscious Citizens, Ghana, has uh, joined us on Zoom. I would like to thank you so much for your time. Now, what do you make of what is happening? I mean, there's been accusation and counter-accusation, and then this coming at the back of it. What do you make of, it, make of that? Good evening. Thank you for inviting me. I think that the situation is quite serious, and uh, investigations need to be conducted. Allegations have been made, and we thank God that the gentleman is still alive. But investigations need to be conducted as a matter of extreme urgency that we can ascertain the truth of the allegations and the persons responsible for this uh, dastardly act should be arrested, prosecuted, and hopefully convicted of the offenses they have committed. The fight against Galamse is assuming so many um, dangerous proportions and it really needs to be nipped in the bud. Mm. Uh, the minister says that we should not limit it to uh, just uh, allegations. We should ensure that people come forth with evidence so that some people can be tied down to the sort of things that they are doing, allegedly doing in the sector. What do you make of that as well from the minister? I mean, the rule of law, obviously, we don't just uh, run with allegations. We need evidence. But I believe that there have been eyewitnesses. So what the police need to do is do a thorough investigation. Evidence will never fall into your laps. You need to do some investigation and get to the root of the matter. Because if people who speak out against Galamse, um, their parents' homes are torched and their relatives are, uh, you know, seriously assaulted. Who is going to speak out against um, Galamse? And as we speak, people have spoken out against Galamse. Some very high-level uh, persons have been involved, and we can't see that anything is being done. Mm -hmm. I know the uh, media coalition against Galamse has called for the arrest of uh, Chairman Wontumi for... Um, you know, committing uh, so many offenses and or for being in the forest reserve. And I don't know what is happening to that. But until people can see that highly placed persons who are alleged to be involved are being investigated to ascertain the truth of the allegations, the fight against Galamse will not be deemed to be a very serious one. Mm. Now, the minister gave a report that today uh, we still have the military embarking on the Operation Hall to ensure that more small uh, illegal small scale miners are arrested. Uh, mm -hmm. We've done this over the past uh, six years, seven, eight years. We've not really had the desired results. What do you uh, think should happen, even when we still keep the military 
on the ground to help in the fight against Galamse? I think that we had results in the past. Mm. I believe that immediately we need to halt or mm. have a pause on community mining. There needs to be a pause. Mm. And there should be no stepping into forest reserves. No ifs, no buts. I didn't hear that. There are no exceptional circumstances. A forest reserve is a forest reserve. It is there for a purpose. For heaven's sake, no mining, no prospecting. Why do people do prospecting? Is it to write a book? You do prospecting to find out if there are valuable minerals you can exploit and make money. So why would anybody allow prospecting in a forest reserve? So the magic words I wanted to hear today, which I didn't hear, was no mining whatsoever, no ifs, no buts in forest reserves, and then a pause on uh, community mining until we get our act together, because obviously we haven't got our act together. And of course, we should all realize that even where people have licenses, does that mean they're not breaking the law? If you have a driving license, does that mean that you do everything as you should do? Of course not. So even with those who have licenses to mine, are we, is anybody watching that they are not close to the waterbeds? Is anybody watching what they are doing? Or do we just issue them with licenses and go to sleep? We really need to wake up. And all officials who have been sleeping on the job should be held accountable. Mm. Aula, uh, we, we have some large-scale mining companies which are operating in forest here in the country. Shouldn't we rather be asking for the authorities in charge of ensuring that they regulate the sector to be effective in regulation than to say no at all when there's that possibility for large-scale miners to be working in forest. Again, let me state that the law does not allow small-scale mining or miners to, to have access to the forest. Large-scale mining can. So it's not about asking the authorities to be more effective with ensuring that the right things are done. The authority should be effective. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But I'm also making a point that not every forest is a forest reserve. They are forest reserves, they are protected forest reserves, and they are there for a reason. And therefore, if we are serious about illegal mining, let's be clear that nobody should be giving any entry into forest reserves. So it is very disappointing that the Forestry Reserve, sorry, the Forestry Commission, whose mandate is to protect our forests for unborn generation, should actually say in a letter that has been circulated on the internet, that they had no objections into entry into a forest reserve for the purposes of mining. They actually said we have no objection to mining. We are not objecting to mining, but we are, not, we are saying that there should be no mining in forest reserves because the forests are our land. If we are going to allow um, mining in forest reserves, we are going to be sowing a lot of trouble for ourselves. We can already see the results. Mm -hmm. And we know that... Um, why I was talking about the community mining having a pause, we obviously don't have our act together. We can't monitor. And therefore, if we want to have some restoration, let's have a pause okay. and let's reflect. Let's see how we can get out uh, the EPA, Forestry mm. Commission, Minerals Commission to get their act together okay. before we decide whether or not it's a wise thing to do. And as I've said, even those who have legal licenses to be, in the, to be engaged in mining, they need to be monitored to ensure that they are abiding by the law. Because the fact that they have licenses doesn't mean that they are not breaking any laws mm -hmm. and that the EPA is monitoring. Okay. It, it, the situation is dire I'm and grateful. serious steps need to be taken. I'm grateful. Aula Sewa is uh, the coordinator for Eco Conscious uh, Citizens at GH. Now let's still stay in the uh, natural resources arena because the Minister for Land and Natural Resources says the Forestry Commission is investigating circumstances under which Akunta Mining Company Limited, a mining firm linked to the Ashanti Region Chairman of the Governing MPP, Bernard Nchibo Siakon, entered the Tano Nimri Forest Reserve to mine. According to him, the government believes in the rule of law and will therefore ensure that the laws governing the land is effectively applied to ensure Galamsi activities are dealt with. He spoke in an exclusive interview with my colleague, MFA Apau. Chairman, I want to miss case is being investigated by the Forestry Commission. The Office of Special Prosecutor is also investigating aspects of it. We have to await the report of these... Uh, How long does the Forestry Commission have to investigate? I hope soon. And, and on a bit... I, I hope very soon in these matters. And then when it is all uh, said and done and we have the facts and we have the evidence on our table, we will take the consequential decision and move forward. Yeah. I think we'll examine all of them and we'll take it from there. 
Now, the Fix the Country activist Oliver Barker Vormer says the state is unnecessarily delaying his trial. He's charged with treason felony after making comment on Facebook, which have been deemed by the state as a coup threat. He wants the judiciary to take a strict stance against the state for any future delay tactics. Kwasante, as a wrap of a busy day in court where evangelist Patricia Sedu alias Agrada was denied bail again and also the trial of former PPA boss A.B. A.J. for the contract for sale scandal scheduled for the ending of November. The case involving Oliver Bakavomawa, who is now accused by the state of freezing felony, has now been adjourned to 21st October for the lawyers for Oliver to argue the application to strike out the bill of indictment that has been filed against the youth activist. Oliver Bakavomawa himself is not so excited with the way the case is traveling. He's accusing the state of deliberately trying to delay the trial and that the state is not interested in justice and is not interested in the rights of citizens. We went through a committal proceeding that should have taken a week. It took six months to get through a committal proceeding. In fact, it shouldn't even have taken a day. The, f the day finally we did the committal proceeding, it was one day. And if it took six months to get through something that was done in a day, it shows a clear intention on the part of the state not to, well, very, very unconcerned about the delays to justice. It's something they are used to. This is all they have. In fact, this is their 15 minutes of fame because they, they know there's no, there's no evidence. But then again, they are led in arms by persons who have, who have lost the trust of the people, who have lost the faith, and, and even they have, there's no desire on their part to keep the, the demands of democracy that we have. So we are not surprised that this thing can continue to go on. But before you charge any person, you must already have your case prepared. In fact, what they are good at is the PR, right? Like we are parroting these words of free trial, whatever it says they're talking about. But these are persons who are not committed to it. They do not understand it. They have no interest in it because it's a republic which is best known for its impunity. And if impunity leads the way, they can do anything and get away with it. What are you and I going to do? There was another drama in court when Oliver Bak of Amawo, who was draped in the Ghana flag, was asked to remove the flag together with some supporters of his from the court premises. Oliver Bak of Amawo has been telling me that that was a surprise and that he did not think that sending the Ghana flag to the courtroom was such a big deal. One of the things that has happened in this democracy is that uh, very often you've had the, the entire judiciary under the thumb of the executive, that a lot of the times when these delays are prolonged, these practices of I haven't filed this, I'm supposed to do it by having done it, it's only because the court system is tolerated. And if, if the judge in this case is showing an in, or, or disinterest in that kind of uh, games from the executive, then, fair, then better for all of us, right? And of course, the, there's no doubt that the spotlight is going to, going to be on the judiciary. So far, they, they're having how should I say, discredited themselves or conducted themselves with such, uh, with anything that anybody would admire. That's why we are still in this quagmire until how many, how many uh, months on. So hopefully we can get the process quashed and then this uh, trumped up charges thrown away and everybody can get on with their lives. Finally, finally, will you come to court again with the Ghana flag, given that the judge says you have to fold it and put it somewhere? I think that it's important to me that the flag is a symbol of what this republic stands for, isn't it? And so as long as the flag continues to represent the best of our people, and it was with pride that we put the flag in place, that it's become a part of the national identity. That when we call on the youth to rise for, for Mother Ghana, we raise the flag as a symbol of that unity, or as, as that call to action. And so it's always going to be a part of how we represent ourselves because we believe in what the patriotic message of the flag sends. Another matter that was also in court today has to do with ABAJ. You should remember that case of the former PPA boss who is accused of selling contracts. The special prosecutor is currently pursuing the case. Today was case management conference where the trial now scheduled to start from the 29th of November. So Nana Grada will spend the next four days in police cells. Application by her lawyers for a bill was refused again by the security court because the police is still investigating the matter. She's charged with charlatanic advertisement and six counts of defrauding by false pretenses. The case will be recorded on the 17th of October, where we expect that the lawyers will make another application for bail. At the court premises today were a number of her church members who sang with her as the police whisked her away in a moving vehicle. And so the church members say she is innocent and that God 
will ultimately get her free very soon. Now, the Ministry of Interior has hinted of plans to develop advanced early warning systems that will help government and its agencies to adequately prepare for disasters and reduce the damage to lives and properties. Speaking at an event to commemorate the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, here in Accra, Chief Director of the Ministry of Interior, Adelaide Anok Kumi, while sympathizing with the victims of the wager flooding disaster, underscored the need to have a more harmonized warning system. She believes this will give disaster management agencies ample time to mobilize and evacuate affected persons. The document has an action plan attached to it. NADMO has submitted an elaborate budget to government through the Ministry of Interior and is receiving attention. Invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, for the past one year, we have suffered as a nation several natural and human-induced disasters, including conflicts, road and boat accidents, chemical explosion, and floods. The flooding that occurred last week in Wajabba with municipality that caused extensive damage to property demands special mention. I take this opportunity to express my heartfelt sympathy to the families who lost their valuables and to those who suffered injuries and other health-related problems. I wish them a speedy recovery. Government is doing all in its power to bring lasting solution to such unfortunate occurrences. Ladies and gentlemen, early warning, as indicated already, is key to one's survival in an emergency. Effective early warning involves knowledge about the hazard, appropriate equipment and technology. The videos showed us a lot and we have a lot to, to deliberate on as we move along. You may agree with me that the starting point of establishing effective early warning system is knowing what to do and not to do at any point in time. This means the public must be well sensitized through early available means, handbills, radio and television discussions, social media, drama, or music. The method chosen must appeal to the targeted audience. That is why I salute UNESCO Ghana for spearheading the introduction to Ghana, the Japanese company Challenge, which is specialized in the manufacturing of earthquake early warning equipment and to donate aid equip guard equipment that warns people to evacuate buildings when an earthquake occurs. UNESCO, we are grateful. Today, UNESCO Ghana and World Food Program are to donate to government this animated video on what to do during earthquake events. Meanwhile, Director of the National Disaster Management Organization, Eric Nana Ajiman Prempe, said some relief items have been sent to victims of the wager flood. He also says investigations have begun into what could be the possible cause of the unprecedented flooding, including an audit of houses built on waterways. It was flood. It wasn't only in Wager, it was all over the country with the Bagre Dam and the torrential rain in the north, in the middle belt of the country there were uh, uh, floods all over. It wasn't only in Wager. In Wager, personally I was there, our team, the NADMO team together with the assembly were there to do search and rescue, they did assessment. Personally I was there with my team, we went there, you heard it, we have sent relief items there. Yes, even though some people uh, complain it wasn't enough, we've added, other organizations are added. We are a, a coordinating agency. When disaster happens, people come to our aid. So we have responded to major disaster, all right. But after the water has receded, we have to look at the long term. What caused the, 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 the disaster in wager, right? What caused it? You know, you cannot stop flooding. Definitely there will be flooding, but the effect of it, what are we doing? 
the wager dam can always be spilled when the water levels are high. But every water has got its banks, where when the water level is full, the water can pass through the bank. But people are doing illegal constructions all over along the banks of the, uh, the, the, the dam. That caused the uh, overflow. A district assembly must go all out to demolish all unauthorized structures that are in waterways that causes our flood. We must do it. Sometimes we must take harsh decisions. That's for watching Join News Prime. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we have more for you here. Stay with us. <music> Now, crop pests can hugely impact yields and result in post-harvest losses. Fumigating, however, can be daunting, especially for large farms. The Technology Consultancy Center of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has come up with a tractor-mounted sprayer. On Tech Thursday, Lava Firm's Kwesi Debra speaks with the innovators who have also developed a mechanical cocoa pot breaker. Uh, my name is Asaya Kumia Michael. A mechanical engineering student of KNUST. My name is Mikel Mubarak. Mechanical engineering student of KNUST. My name is Benjamin Donkobwa from the Mechanical Engineering Department of KNUST. My name is McDaniels Adinote Afro, an agriculture and biosystems engineer of KNUST. And we've been able to design a cocoa splitting and piece extraction machine as you can see here. First, Ghana is one of the largest producers of cocoa. Right? So it means there's a lot of demand for the production process to be mechanized in order to be able to produce these quantities. Okay. But unfortunately, um, in the farm, we use hard slashes to break the cocoa pots. Right? And that is very inefficient and dangerous. So okay. because of designing a machine that could still break the cocoa pots without using manual labor. So as the name goes, it's there basically to extract the beans from the cocoa pot. So it uses two processes. You first cut the cocoa pot, okay. that would break open the husk in the cutting chamber. Then second, you do the second stage of the machine operation, where you beat the beans out using the rotating seat. Richmond. Uh, my name is Enchi Ose Eric. Petia for Alberta. And we fabricated a tractor mounted sprayer. The, what motivated us to fabricate this tractor mounted sprayer is the issue of crop pests on farmlands. And this caused um, post harvest losses to farmers. And so this is the tractor mounted sprayer. It has three point linkage here which will be mounted on the tractor and it drives its power from the power takeoff of the tractor using the power takeoff shaft. The power takeoff shaft powers the pump and this pump pressurizes the um, loud, loud. liquid. This, this um, pump pressurizes the liquid and from that it moves to through the pipes to the nozzles. So the nozzles are the ones that perform the spray. And we have a water level indicator that shows the level of water in the tank so that the farmer can easily see it. And this is the back view. This shows, this back view has a mechanism that helps the farmer in the spray. The, the farmer can turn it this way and lift it. That is when the farmer wants to travel with this without using it. This is the normal position. But when the farmer wants to spray, can you bring it down? 
When a farmer wants to spray shutter crops, the farmer has to bring it down and stretch it like this so that he can spray shutter crops. And in this section, this side, anyway. this section, the farmer can lift this one up to spray taller trees like mangoes. So this is the mechanism that we've developed to help. This is a mechanism that we've developed to help farmers with the issue of um, crop pests on farmlands. You can also lift this one up to achieve higher heights apart from this specified one. The, the technology consult, consultancy center won a proposal from the Royal Academy of Engineering, UK. And the, the, the project was on a higher education partnership in sub-Sahara Africa. That entails innovation, design, and production of innovative co engineering components. Now, community-based health planning and services, CHIPS compounds, are supposed to help reduce the pressure on major health facilities by managing minor health cases at the community level. However, at the Garu and Timpani district of the Upper East region, these CHIPS compounds are poorly resourced and therefore have very little to offer clients. According to healthcare officials, due to the lack of equipment at the CHIPS compounds, pregnant women sometimes have to travel several kilometers on tricycles to other health facilities just to get tested for something as basic as anemia. The Catholic Relief Services is, however, stepping up with some help. Correspondent Albert Sorry has more. Within this district, that is the Timpani district, uh, most of the facilities do not do not have basic equipment to, to work with. The, the HB machine, lying beds are quite uh, inadequate, even delivery beds, delivery sets, sunny case. Basic, basic things are not even available to assist the pregnant woman uh, identify key variables such as uh, inadequate uh, um, HB, that is, uh, if they are anemic, we are unable to even test. Eugene Osei Yeboah is the district director of health for Timpani. He is not happy about the lack of basic equipment at community-based health planning and services or CHIPS centers in the district. These facilities are important in helping manage some basic health cases at the community level, but here in Timpani, they are not well resourced. At least if um, a, a pregnant woman is not going to travel 15 kilometers on a motorcane, I mean these tricycles, on these bumpy roads, just to get their HB checked and it's going to be done at the chips level, then I think uh, it's good news to all of us. In the neighboring Garu district, the story is no different. Hippolyte Yelido is the district health director. CHIPS is the foundation of health service delivery. Uh, in Garu district, for instance, we have just about uh, three health centers. The rest are CHIPS. So we had a woman who delivered at home and then uh, had to be rushed in. If there is a complication during the home delivery, then we are likely to lose both mother and the baby. So without CHIPS, there is no way the health service delivery will be meaningful. To help make healthcare delivery more effective in the community-based health planning and services compounds, the Catholic Relief Services, CRS, has decided to donate some basic equipment and other supplies to these facilities. Alhaji Halik Adam is Programs Officer at the Catholic Relief Services. We have been talking about last mile care. In trying to improve access and coverage, it is the rural areas, most part of the rural areas do not have the needed care. They don't have the facilities to be able to take care of the sick, which is something which uh, the uh, sustainable development goals is trying to improve, especially maternal and child health care. A total of 50 healthcare staff took part in the training.
Some of them said the training was an enlightening experience for them. The program was a success because in order to work with the community in a rural setting like Timpani District, you need to get acquainted with the community to be able to work with them. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Timpani. Thanks for watching Joy News Prime. We'll break for showbiz. Stay with us. Now, European nations have condemned the Russian strikes on Ukrainian cities and have pledged more support for Kiev. This comes as European leaders also discuss how to better help citizens affected by the rising cost of living. In Germany, a new poll has revealed a big majority are concerned about the current economic situation as the country reached the highest inflation rate in decades. Thomas Sparrow says, uh, Bilona, he has been looking at how, um, how uh, we've been speaking to me, he's joining us with some more. And uh, Thomas, how are European leaders reacting to this new phase of the war? ...on Ukrainian cities have been strongly criticized, not only here in Germany, but by many other countries as well. Leaders of the group of seven nations, the G7, said they would hold Russian authorities accountable for the attacks, which probably means more targeted sanctions, and they promised Ukraine more support, not only politically, but also militarily. The key term here is air defense, especially to protect the civilian population in Ukraine by repelling air attacks. The US reportedly promised to send advanced air defense systems to Ukraine as well as Germany, it was reported this week that Ukraine received the first of four promised German air defense systems described as the most advanced system Germany has. Now, there's a big debate about how uh, to help citizens and businesses affected by the rising cost of living. What are countries like Germany planning? German authorities recently presented a package worth around 200 billion euros, which was intended to help not only citizens, given the current rise in energy prices in particular, but also businesses that have been affected by the current economic situation. And whereas for many here in Germany, that was an important decision by the German government, it has indeed caused concern abroad, in particular among European partners, which believe that Germany is acting, quote, selfishly. In other words, that Germany speaks about solidarity, but when it comes to working together with other European countries, it acts rather alone. And that essentially what that is creating, this very big German package to help citizens and businesses, is a bigger divide between richer European countries and poorer European countries. But from a German perspective, this is certainly a big development. It's not the first relief package that the German government has presented. It probably won't be the last relief package that the German government presents, especially as consumers, especially as citizens and businesses are very concerned indeed about the current economic development here in the country. Now, we understand some polls have already been done. What do polls reveal about the current situation in Europe and how concerned are citizens? In one word, concern, that is something that you can clearly see from those different polls. One poll here in Germany presented only a few days ago revealed that a vast majority, around 80% of Germans are concerned about the current economic situation. Even more Germans are concerned about the economic situation in a year's time. And what's interesting as well is that a majority of Germans are actually critical of the way the government has reacted. So these relief packages that we've just mentioned are actually seen to a large extent critically, although for some obviously they are important, an important help towards paying those very high energy bills. But it's clear that Germans would want the government authorities in general to do much more when it comes not only to guaranteeing energy security, although gas storage is now basically full, but also when it comes to helping citizens and businesses in need, especially considering Germans believe the situation will not necessarily improve but in the next few months could get even more difficult for many. Thomas Sparrow is with the DW. And that's how we wrap up our bulletin for you today. There's more news on myjoyonline.com.